So hello and welcome everyone. My name is Sam and I will be your host today for the webinar about the Masters in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. We're really excited to talk more about our program in an information session style. Um, if we want to move to the next slide, I can talk over the agenda and then introduce our panelists. Awesome. So we are going to talk today more about the School of Medicine here at Case Western Reserve as a whole. We'll get in more into about the MA program in bioethics and medical humanities, talk about the application process and the deadlines and what to expect from that, what things that you need to provide in order to finish that application, and then we'll get into a Q&A at the end. Oh, of course, Q&A feature, that's actually more important, more important to start off with and then we can get into the rest of the meat and potatoes. So if you are on a desktop, you're actually going to check down at the, either the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on how Zoom is configured, you're going to see a, it'll say Q&A, but then it'll also show two, an icon that looks like two chat bubbles that are overlapping each other. If you happen to be listening and hopping on with us through a mobile device, it'll be to the left-hand top side of your screen. There'll be three lines. You'll click that and then you'll have a menu that pops down and you'll see the question answer um, subline. You'll click that and it'll be able to give you all of the options to be able to type out your questions. And you can start typing those as soon as now if you'd like. Um, and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Now I can introduce our awesome panelists. So today with us, we have Dr. Eileen Anderson, who is the Director of Education, and Dr. Leah Jeanette, who is the Assistant Director of Education. And I will let them introduce themselves more, but thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. It, it is a great joy and privilege to be here to talk about our MA program in bioethics and medical humanities. Um, as you said, I direct the educational programs um, and the MA program here at Case Western Reserve. And as you're going to hear in this presentation, we are a passionate department with of an array, a spectrum of expertise in bioethics and medical humanities. And we love this program, which is one of the oldest in the country. Um, and it is running strong. This is a program that we hold incredibly dear. And we reevaluate and we reassess every single year since everything around us having to do with health and medicine and biotech and global health um, and all of our different uh, technologies, policies are always in constant flux. We, this is a program that we take seriously to keep contemporary, even though it is one of the oldest in the United States. Dr. Jeanette, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So um, I am, um, as Dr. Anderson said, I'm Dr. Uh, Leah Jeanette. I'm Assistant Director of Education. Um, I'm also a Senior Research Associate in the department. Um, I'm also an alum of the master's program. So I graduated many years ago uh, from the program and then went and on and studied um, bioethics and uh, clinical ethics and then came back to Case Western Reserve and the Department of Bioethics and um, thoroughly enjoy being back here. Um, it'll be uh, six years now that I've been back and love being here, love working with our students and teaching and interacting with them. Um, and then the other part of my job, I'm also a clinical ethicist at University Hospitals. So one of our teaching hospitals here in Cleveland. Um, and part of um, what I do, and we'll talk a little bit um, later on in the presentation, is I'm the course director for our clinical ethics rotations, which is a hallmark of our program. It's one of the reasons that students love our program and it's been a part of it since the very beginning. And it's an opportunity for students to um, just dive into the applied side of bioethics and really understand, you know, how bioethics works in the clinical setting. So we're so delighted to have you join us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeanette. And I wanted to 
kind of follow up on something you said. So Dr. Jeanette is a clinical ethicist and I am actually a medical and psychological anthropologist. Um, and in our, by, by disciplinary training, and in our department, one of the things that keeps it so dynamic is that our faculty are coming from all of these different disciplines. We have clinicians, we have clinical ethicists, we have people with degrees in philosophy, in literature, there are a couple anthropologists, sociology, bioethics itself. So there's a, there's a wide array. We also have faculty embedded in the hospitals, in other departments around the university, and even in some of our neighboring cultural institutions, such as museums. So the kind of spectrum of bioethics and medical humanities that we are capable of providing here at Case Western Reserve is very unusual nationally. It's very unusual to find, and we have carefully crafted this diverse set of uh, expertise where there is research going on in all of these areas and also educational opportunities. So the School of Medicine is an amazing place to be. Um, always ranked number one in Ohio. Actually, the 2022 U.S. News just came out and it was uh, ranked number 24. So we've actually gone up. But in different subspecialties, such as in value added ed education, um, last time I checked, which might have been 2021, we were third in the United States. So it is, it is an absolute top-notch R1 school of medicine. And then the medicine is embedded with the school of medicine is embedded within the entire university where there are eight total schools and our students actually work with faculty research teams take classes in all of the other schools so maybe you're interested in health law and our center for health law is actually the first and one of the best in the country. Some of our students are really interested in like AI ethics. And so they are working on projects that we have collaborations with uh, biomedical engineers. Some are working with medical historians or arts and medicine. So there is the full of array. And as Dr. Jeanette said, and we'll highlight later, all of our students get this incredible access to clinical practica and and being there for the clinical moment in the hospitals and really getting to then think carefully about the ethical, cultural justice issues that you've witnessed in the hospital setting. So this area of bioethics and medical humanities has been booming. It's been growing. Programs have been growing. Interest has been growing. Um, hospitals are really wanting more and more of this. Medical school curricula are being revised to make bioethics and medical humanities essential. It, why, right? I think it's really interesting having the recent pandemic that we are still dealing with. Um, in some ways, that's made it more palatable. Where so many of our big questions in medicine, you know, health, illness, death and dying, um, so and and oh, so many other examples come to mind. Um, global health, etc. So many of our questions are not about, don't have to do with technical expertise. They don't have to do even with in-depth biology. For example, some of the problems that are still killing, um, you know, more, for example, children in the world than anything else are things like diarrhea, where the technology is not that high tech, right? So the questions become, how, to, how do we distribute um, scarce resources, right? How do we roll out vaccines? How do we distribute ventilators if they are, there's a limited supply? So the questions are, should we intervene? 
How should we intervene? When should we intervene? How do we deal with issues of justice? What happens if we're developing amazing genetic therapeutics now where one dose of medication costs $1.5 million, but it's life-saving? How do we deal with that kind of a question? So these kinds of questions around values, around human behavior, and how do we account for these things in our policies and practices? These are the questions that are so essential to all different branches of medical practice today. And so it's been a very, very needed and um, hot topic that has been expanding and expanding. And we're very grateful for that because these core questions of what are the underlying values creating conflicts? How do we solve these? How do we take right action? And, and what are we prioritizing when we set different kinds of policies, maybe at a hospital or maybe even nationally? So you can imagine because the demand is so high right now for people who have background and, and training in bioethics and medical humanities that it's an amazing thing for watching our students' career paths and for enhancing your career path in many, whichever direction you're going. So the nature of these fields are interprofessional and they are multidisciplinary. In our program, you are really going to witness this interprofessional delivery of healthcare, the multidisciplinary aspects of say a research project. When you are asking big questions, you need multiple perspectives and multiple players coming to the table to really tackle our tough questions, whether it's a you know pandemic or a cutting edge technology, or some kind of issue of distributive justice, for example. Um, so lots of different fields have been for a while, but are even increasingly looking for students with this kind of educational training. Um, so clinical careers for sure. Lots of our students go on to be MDs or nurses, social workers, psychologists, et cetera. Having this kind of orientation before you head down that path, or sometimes in our dual degree programs simultaneously, um, really our, our alums, we have hundreds and hundreds of alums who come back and talk about how it gave them a leg up both professionally, but also in their knowledge base that they were ready to tackle tough questions that some of their contemporaries weren't. Um, and certainly in legal professions and, and health law is a very, very broad field, the way it touches. Um, a number of our students go on to research and regulatory work. We actually have a concentration in research ethics where students get hands-on experience working at an IRB institutional review board, which does the ethics review of say research studies. Um, and, and so that research and regulatory work um, is so important to our health and educational enterprises today. And so our students are very highly sought after for those kinds of positions. In the arts and humanities, a number of our students will go on to complete PhDs in some kind of medical humanities. So a um, medical history or literature and medicine, or there's, an, there's a wide array. We've got um, one of our PhD students who is one of the nation's experts on arts and medicine, um, and th particularly theater and medicine. So there's Having this kind of clinical exposure, academic exposure, we offer travel courses, so potentially even international exposure, bringing that to the table as you go on into your next step is something that we, we hear from those who are recruiting our students for various reasons and from our alum is something that enhance their competence and enhance their kind of competitive positioning. Um, obviously, 
um, this kind of program is fantastic for anyone who wants to be a bioethicist, going to public health and other kinds of academic and applied medicine. Um, a final, well, not final, but another main pattern that we see among our students are students who come in and say, I really love health. I really love medicine. I really want to enhance people's well being, but I don't know exactly how I want to do that. I don't know if I want to be a doctor. I don't know if I want to work in a nonprofit. I don't know if I want to do some other kind of role at a hospital. I don't know if I want to work in a global health you know, non-governmental organization. So our students get such um, diverse exposure in the clinical setting, in the classroom setting, and some of applied experiences that it is, uh, in fact, I had a wonderful conversation with a student who came in on this pathway, really looking for discernment, who now is crystal clear of her next steps and is marching down that path successfully um, from this year's cohort. So it's a great place to kind of figure it out. Some of our students will come in, they know exactly what they want to do. They will choose their courses and capstone and other work that way. And they will exit on that pathway, having been enhanced for the year they spent with us. Others come in and say, I want to figure it out. And the advising system works with those students to you know, make sure they're getting the exposure they need to figure it out. And it, they figure it out. Lots of reasons to come. Wow, so we are entering our 27th year. Um, if you do the full intensive program, it is two semesters, fall and spring. And Dr. Jeanette alluded to this um, at the beginning, but there, <clears throat> there are many um, unusual aspects of our um, program. So I will highlight here, the, the clinical opportunities, because that is something really unique, kind of guaranteed to each student. We, because we expect that students are coming from many different pathways, we'll have this intensive experience together, and then we'll go out into many different pathways. We really work on personalized advising for each student. So students are assigned an advisor that looks like the closest fit. And most students end up developing advising relationships with other faculty and staff who they're taking a class with, or who maybe they're assisting on research or something like that. So we have um, coursework that everybody has to take that is the, the foundations of the program, including a capstone, including these clinical rotations, including a foundations class, but you get nearly half the credits that are electives to customize the curriculum for you and your particular pathway. And you would do that with the assistance of your faculty and staff advising team. Um, something else very unusual at the master's level is that we offer competitive student assistantships to offset tuition that gives students some amazing professional experience. So some of our students will become research assistants and actually get hands-on research assistant, um, you know, experience while they are earning this um, tuition offset. Others will, you know, and again, we try to match depending on who is getting the assistantships and what their goals are. Others will assist with teaching. So they may serve in a, a sort of teaching assistant fashion for some of our undergrad classes in both bioethics and medical humanities. Others will be program assistants. And there's an array of um, things that they can do depending on you know, their skills and the department's needs. I've alluded to, we, we offer two optional concentrations, or you can do the traditional program where all those electives are yours to create. If you do a concentration, it's a deep dive into one area or the other. So the medicine, society, and culture concentration is a deep dive into medical humanities, social medicine, and medicine and arts. The research ethics concentration is a deep dive into those kind of regulatory 
IRB ethical issues. And so for, if you're completing a concentration, you would have another 4.5 credits of required um, coursework that is a core seminar in each one, and then a more kind of contemporary topics, one and a half credit um, course that is personalizable um, for the other credits. And then in the spring semester, there are different op options for practica in addition to our traditional clinical ethics um, rotations. We also offer a variety of dual degree programs um, that are with other kind of D level, doctoral level, like MD, JD, et cetera, um, programs or with other master's level programs. Dr. Jeanette, will you talk about the clinical ethics rotations? Absolutely. So as I mentioned um, at the beginning, um, we have this fantastic opportunity for students called clinical ethics rotations. These are opportunities, um, 80 hours in the fall semester, 80 hours in the spring semester to spend in our teaching hospitals here in Cleveland. Um, we have four different teaching hospitals. So you're assigned one hospital in the fall, one hospital in the spring. The goal is to get you into one public and one private to experience that culture of that hospital. So you get the opportunity to go on different types of rounds, different types of committee meetings, and one-on-one -on -one with healthcare professionals. On a weekly basis, you'll meet with your fellow students and a clinical ethicist or ethics committee member to unpack what you've experienced, what you've observed, what meetings you've sat on, what conversations you participated in, to really uh, like do a deep dive into those ethics, those ethics issues, those issues of justice. Right, to understand and to, you know, really, you know, do a deep dive into, you know, what's, what's going on. And sometimes they're really challenging cases because these are real people with lives and patients and complex cases and, and, and stories. And um, there's an opportunity to really think through, you know, what comes next. And it, they're amazing opportunities for students. We really try to pair you with a site that has opportunities that you're interested in. Um, we take into account, um, you know, what you're passionate about and what makes the most sense. Um, they're fantastic and students really love these opportunities. And so we're very excited to be able to offer these um, every semester to our students. And so when you leave the program, you have you're able to say, you know, you spent 160 hours in, inside teaching hospitals here in Cleveland that have um, amazing reputations across the, um, not just the country, but even in some cases around the world. So um, I'll also um, talk a little bit about our short-term study abroad elective. So as was referenced, we also offer three credit hour courses that travel during winter break, spring break, or in May. And these are electives you can take, and they really focus on, you know, talking about cultural comparisons of bioethics and medical humanities issues and, and discussions. And it's a way for you to get an elective, but also get some cross-cultural experience, some travel experience. As you can see, um, there's a variety of places to go. The topics are all different depending on what location you go to. What's great about them is while they are, you register for them during the regular semester, you actually get to go between the semesters or during spring break. So they aren't um, intense during your semester, but the, the intensity of the, the course takes place between um, those breaks, which is a fantastic. We're really excited to relaunch these. They've kind of been on pause because of the pandemic. So we're really excited to get to relaunch these as soon as we can. Oh, we sure are. <laughs> <laughs> There's such wonderful experiences oh. for our students. And then the other thing I will I will talk about is, you know, the other thing students are always hungry for is ways to get involved in research. And because we, as was mentioned, we are an R1 research university, that means we're doing grants across the university. Our faculty and staff within our department are also very research active at all different levels, local, national, international. It's amazing to see the work that our faculty and staff are involved in. And that can be done through 
attending different events within our department, whether it's bi-monthly research core forums, work in progress seminars, um, joining in on Metro Health or University Hospitals grand rounds and hearing about ongoing projects and discussions, or that could be joining a faculty and staff on research projects, coming alongside and joining in and learning what they're doing. And the other thing that we've started um, in our department, um, which is amazing, is teaching students about the research skills in the world of bioethics and medical humanities. A lot of students come in with research skills that may be more applicable to the world of science. And, you know, they have lab science and bench, bench skills. But in bioethics and medical humanities, it's a little different. And so we're pleased to be able to offer that opportunity to students to teach them skills that they may not have. And so um, those and are great is, opportunities. It, yeah, and it's really cool in a world where like our large federal granting agencies are really wanting to see mixed methods work. So it expands what students you know, are capable of before they go on to their next step. So some of our students will like go right to NIH for different kinds of fellowships because they know they've gotten that kind of rigorous training. So um, our student assistantships, as we mentioned, uh, are an amazing part of our program. And I just wanted to highlight one more time the opportunity that it offers. So for those who apply for this and get involved in teaching, research, and administrative roles, you do receive a partial tuition waiver. And so on average, students receive about $5,000 over the academic year to offset costs. But you gain amazing experience. In some cases, students even go on to publish and you get to know faculty and the experience and, and things cannot be overstated. Um, I know Dr. Anderson, you have worked with students in especially the teaching and research roles and the amazing things that students have gotten out of these opportunities um, are just phenomenal. Um, but it also is really unique to master's programs. Um, the key to being eligible for student assistantships is that you do have to submit your master's program application by our May 15th um, priority two deadline. And then the student assistantship application will automatically come to you in an email and you have to submit that application by June 1. So speaking of our master's program application, um, so the required materials for a completed application package include transcript from all undergrad and grad programs. We look for a statement of purpose. This is kind of like a personal essay. And what we're really looking for is you to tell us about your interest in bioethics and medical humanities. And we're looking for how that fits into your overall career path. And that could also be that you're looking for discernment, right? It doesn't have to all fit into a nice, neat little box. It could be that you're still figuring it out. Um, we look for a CV or a resume, and then two letters of recommendation, including one from a faculty or professor. Um, you can actually submit your application before those letters have been received. So don't hesitate to hit submit before those come in. And then once we have a completed application, uh, we will review and then ultimately interview you for the program. And we can typically render a decision within two to three weeks. So it's a pretty quick process. So just to highlight again, deadlines, um, our priority two deadline is May 15th. So if you wanna be eligible for student assistantships, you wanna submit by May 15th. And then the student assistantship deadline is June 1st. Our final deadline for um, a false start is August 1st. And then of course, classes begin in August. We'll have orientation and uh, classes. I can't believe it's, it's like just a few months away. We just wrapped up our spring semester <laughs> and we're already talking about the next cohort um, coming in just a few months. So, um, so those are the deadlines we're looking at. But I wanna open us up to questions. Um, I know that we are at 4.30. So if you're able to stick around and ask questions, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to enter them into the Q&A. 
I love this first question that I'm seeing. What do you look for in a potential graduate student? My immediately thought, my immediate thought on that is somebody with intellectual curiosity and a commitment to make the world a better place. Those are two qualities that we see all the time in our students. And I personally love this kind of the ethos, which is these, our students are so smart and so hardworking, but also like in it to make the world a better place. And it's really beautiful. But, you know, we really take a holistic approach to reviewing applications. So one of the primary things we're looking for is fit. We want to make sure that this program is a good fit for you and your goals. Um, then, of course, we're looking at transcripts. And, you know, not in a uniform way, because sometimes people will start down one path and realize it's not for them. And so maybe those grades, you know, are not relevant for what we're doing. And so we look at how, how did the other classes go? Um, we look at the letters and we look at your statement. Um, what, why is it that you want to be part of this program and what do you hope to get out of it? And then every student has an interview. So we love having an opportunity to have more of a conversation with you about who are you, who is this program and, and what is that fit going to look like? So we had a pre-submitted question that I think would be great for you to answer, Dr. Anderson. Um, so the question had to do with students who come in that eventually want to apply to medical school. And so what percentage or how many students that come to our program eventually do go on to medical school um, successfully, would you say? How would you kind of address that question? Boy, you know, I've looked up these statistics before. I don't have them right in front of me. Um, here's what I will say. The vast majority of students who want to go on to medical school will get in and go on to medical school, which is really saying something, you know, <laughs> considering how competitive it is. And obviously something like your MCAT is, you know, critically important. Um, but this program is considered an enhancer program um, for medical school admissions. Um, and it's, you know, we find that when our students come back from med school interviews, they, they really are talking um, about what they did in this year quite a bit. I believe that the percentage is somewhere around, it's over a third, but probably not quite 40%. I think the it's like in the high 30s are people who are coming in saying, I want to go to medical school and go on to medical school. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I would say that it's, I would say maybe 40. There's, there's yeah, I would say that there's probably a little bit of a disconnect between the number of students who come in and say they're pre-med or pre-health, and then right. the number of students who actually apply for medical school, right? So then, they, because Correct. through this program, students may come to the conclusion that med school isn't the direction they end up going. Um, I am one of those students. I came into this program many years ago saying, I'm going to go to med school. And by the end of this program, I said, I'm going to be a bioethicist. <laughs> right. And so if you would have asked me at the beginning of the program to identify like, what's my career trajectory, I would have said med school. And so yep. that, that would have affected the percentages. And so, I and that's right. I wasn't talking about also the group who knows they're preclinical, but doesn't yeah. know yet, like is considering maybe I want to, or, or yeah. learns about, you know, positions they didn't even know existed by yeah. being in the hospital and says, I'm amazed at what a PA do, does. And that would be a better choice for me for a variety of reasons or, you know, other, I mean, there's so many, or, you know, one student recently came in, was like, I want to go to medical school, was so amazed by what she saw on her, um, regarding mental health on a psychiatry uh, round that she decided what she actually wanted to do was become a clinical psychologist and have a different kind of relationship and practice with students. So, or with patients. 
Um, I think, you know, so let's say it's, it's, you know, a little bit under half. Um, but this again gives the broad exposure, but there, there is a strong cohort every year who is going to medical school. And in fact, we just, it was so amazing to just see on Facebook and things like our students from, you know, several years ago who just got their MDs, um, you know, in the past couple of weeks, it's been very moving. Um, so there is an array. And there's a question about the MDMA dual degree program. Yeah, that one is you, when you're doing any of our dual degrees, you apply separately to each degree program and you have to be accepted separately into each degree program. So we have quite a number of MDMAs every year and they've been, you know, they're enrolled in medical school and then they also are doing our program. We have a long history of being able to pace that out. So for MDMAs, you know, many of them will complete their MA also in the four year, the fourth year and get the dual degree. There are, you know, there are different times in the med school curriculum where you have flexibility and where you don't have flexibility. And we, you are working with one of our faculty who is an MD, who is deeply embedded in the MD uh, curriculum and, and teaching MD students as a mentor to kind of help you plan out how that experience is going to best work for you. And we've crafted our core required courses to allow for that flexibility. So there is never a conflict between the MD curriculum and like the required foundations classes. That is true for all of our dual degrees. Um, so it's paced out a little bit more. And if you want more information about that MD, MA, dual degree, or you wanted to talk to a student who's doing it, um, you know, feel free to, to contact us. So I'm not seeing any more questions come in, but I will say that if you have any further questions, if you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, or anything, please feel free to email us, bioethics at case.edu. We are happy to chat with you, answer questions, whatever, however we can help. And we hope that you submit an application. Um, we look forward to reviewing it and we hope um, to see you in the fall even. Thank you so much for joining us. And I echo Dr. Jeanette's sentiments. Um, and we do, you know, again, you saw the, the timeline, there are rolling admissions happening now. And, you know, we are, we are here and happy to answer questions for you. The other thought I just wanted to mention, it's a question we often get in webinars, is can we do a kind of pre-application review? If you just want to talk about your particular situation or, you know, sometimes students had a really challenging year, so there's an off year or something like that, and you're wondering, because it is an R1 medical school, you can just give us a call and we're happy, um, you know, send an email, we'll set something up, and we can do a quick kind of pre-review if, if you feel a need to do that before you submit an application. And thank you again for joining us here today, and we look forward to being in contact.